Well, good morning, friends and brethren. So very good to see you here this morning. Glad that we can be together, that we have a nice warm place that we can assemble in, but especially hearts that are warm, those who are anxious to be together to worship God. It's good to be here. One time, several years ago, I wanted to take Sandra and the girls to a little mining town that I had been to before. It was Cripple Creek, Colorado. And doesn't that sound cool, even the name of this little mining town? A buddy and I, we had stumbled upon it some years before, and it was just a delightful little place to go. And we were in Colorado on a road trip, and Cripple Creek was a little bit out of the way, but, you know, man, I said, girls, you just got to see this place. It's really cool. And so I was excited about going. Them, not so much. But we went on anyway because this was just an experience. We just needed to go here. And so we drove. It was a better part of two hours out of the way, but we're in Colorado. It's beautiful, like wherever we go. And so it was a town that was It was this old mining town when I had been there, and it had like the old outfitter store and the general store, just old wood clapboard buildings. You could sit on the front porch of the general store and and, uh, have a Coca-Cola and just kind of watch the world go by. And there wasn't a lot of world going by in Cripple Creek. That was the best thing about it. And it was just incredible memories I had, and I wanted to share that with the family. But when we got there, it wasn't exactly the way I remembered it. In fact, it wasn't that way at all. As we came into town, immediately we could see that I knew it had grown up a lot. And in fact, it had taken on a completely different view, a completely different flair. There were casinos everywhere you went. And there were large hotels and a lot of places to eat. And the streets were widened. There were street lights. And it was like, it was like, it was horrible. (laughs) And so I was disappointed And we're trying to work our way out of town. And I was a little bit out of my mind, I guess. I'm going like, can you believe this? Because, you know, nobody else really wanted to go here. But I kind of talked everybody into it. Here it turned out to be a bust. And so as we're leaving town, someone said something to the order of like, well, we better look at a map and figure out how to get back to the main road. And I said, no, no, I got this. You know, I mean, I got the man radar on here. We got this, you know. And so we drive out of town and. And we drove and we drove and we drove. And I might say it was beautiful, majestic Colorado scenery that we were enjoying, okay? And we drive around. And then someone said, kind of made a comment like, you know, we've already been on this road. I said, no, 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 no. We're we're heading out of town. This is a different way that we're going. And we go a little bit farther. And Sandra says, we've come this way before. And I said, no, we're just getting close to the main road, and so it looks familiar. I said, look, we're coming up on a a town right now. We're getting close to the main road. And so we got there. I said, here's the sign for the town. You know, as we got there, we got a little closer. It said, welcome to Cripple Creek, Colorado. (laughs) And, like, how did that happen, you know? And it was like, like, imagine that. And everybody kind of moaned and groaned. I said, look, we've just been on this incredible drive to the majestic Colorado Rockies. You know, I mean, we just intended to make a drive, you know, to see all these beautiful things. And so somewhere along the line there, again, there was a suggestion made. Maybe we should get out the map. And at this point, I thought, maybe that's a good idea. And so we got the map out and worked our way back to the main road. You know, we could not undo the road that had been taken. We could not undo the last hour we had spent seeing the majestic Rocky Mountains, I might say. We could not undo that. We, 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 couldn't, we couldn't change that. You know, we couldn't get the time spent on that excursion. You know, the road and that trip was behind us. That was a road already taken. But what we could do now is look at a map and we could chart a course and we could determine where do we need to go from here. And our goal was to find the main road and get out of Cripple Creek, Colorado. But I would suggest that in life there's a lot of things much more important than that. That we can only spend so much time looking back at the road that's already been taken. We can't do it again. We can't live that time again. We don't have that time to come back. We have to be looking forward at what we are going to do, chart a course for future travels. That's where our mind has to be. You know, for all practical purposes, 
last year or this year still is behind us. Now the calendar is about to turn over to a new year and there's nothing to go back to. There may be some pleasant memories in the past year. Well, maybe even some that's not so pleasant. But we can't go back to any of those. We can't relive those times. We can't, we can't get a do-over on any of those days. Those days are past. The day planner is full from the last year. And if you look at January, you know, there's probably a lot of open spaces still. We're planning out the new year. We cannot undo a single action of the past, but our hope and our promise is to look ahead. That's what we have to do. We've not passed this way before. No one can say we've already been on this road, you know, because the chart, the road that is in front of us is a new road. There may be some things that are familiar and there may be some things that we learned from the road in the past, but it's a new year. It's a new time. It's a new road. What are we going to do with that? How are we going to chart our course? What has been the best year in your life? If you reflect back, most of us have sometimes we think back on and we think, man, that was a great time. That was a great year. Was it the year that you graduated? For some people, that was a, an incredible time. Or maybe the year of getting married or it's the, it's the birth of children. That was a great time, a great year. Some people will say, it was when I came to understand my purpose in life and, and living for the Lord. That was, that was the year. They remember the date and the time, the, the year exactly. And so we can think back, we reflect on what was the best time of our life. But in the big picture, there's only so much that we can say about the past because it's, we've already been there. It's already there. It's, it's, it's the past. But what are we going to do now? What are we going to do as we look forward? And have we thought about this, that God wants our life to be a success? He wants that for us. And God has designed and purposed life in such a way that we can find success. Now, it may depend how we measure success on whether or not we find that in the eyes of God. That's a different point. But I just want to say that God wants us to find success in life. He's always desired the best for his people. Turn to me to Joshua chapter 1. Joshua chapter 1, such an incredibly interesting time in the life of the children of Israel. Forty years of wilderness wandering is, is coming to an end. Even during that difficult time, God was with his people. He traveled along with them, led them, and now they've come to this point where they are preparing to cross over the River Jordan. Joshua chapter 1, verse 7. Be strong and very courageous. Be careful to obey all the law my servant Moses gave you. Do not turn from it to the right or to the left, that you may be successful wherever you go. Do not let this book of the law depart from your mouth. Meditate on it day and night, so that you may be careful to do everything written in it. Then you will be prosperous and successful. Our success in life is dependent on meditation on the right things. And God has proposed to his people, he's, he's told his people, here is how you can be successful. Here's how you can live the life that I would have you live. He's given instruction to them, very specific we might add. The Apostle John makes an interesting point when he writes to Gaius in 3 John chapter, or 3 John verse 1. Look there with me, please. 3 John, verse 1. He begins this, this letter in such an interesting way to me. His introduction, 3 John, verse 1. The elder to the beloved Gaius, whom I love in the truth. Beloved, I pray that you may prosper in all things and be in health just as your soul prospers. There's a couple of things I find just really interesting about that. Uh, first, what a cool way to start a letter to a, to a brother in Christ. You know, there is the concern, the interest in things physical, you know, for health and, and well-being. But he compares that to how his soul is prospering. 
If we get real honest for just a moment, we think about this. How well, how well would our health be if it was just as prosperous as our soul? Think about that a minute. I mean, I understand, and we, we prayed this morning for those even of our number that are sick. We have a lot to pray for right now. And that's right, and that's good for us to do. We're concerned about the health of one another. It's not our greatest concern. Just like with the Apostle John, you know, when he's, when he's, when he's writing to, to Gaius, he makes this point so very clear that his prayer for, for Gaius was not just that he be strong and, and, and in good health. He prays about his soul. But it's just an interesting comparison to me, and it makes me think about uh, what kind of physical health would we be in if our physical health was equated to where our soul is at, our spiritual well-being? How healthy would we be? You get that point? I think that's a good one. I think that really stands out. You know, we have not passed this way before. That could have easily been said of the children of Israel. There they were at the River Jordan, preparing to cross over. They've been 40 years in preparation for this. And yet when the day comes, there seems to be some fear and trepidation. The days of mourning for Moses now are coming to a pass, and the people prepared to cross the river. And we can imagine the, the fear and trepidation that they would have had. They had not passed this way before. This was interesting. This was new to them. There was that one time that some tried to enter in the southern part of Canaan against the will of God. Well, that didn't work so well. Maybe that was on their mind. Perhaps even they were thinking of some times in the 40 years of wilderness wandering where they were not as close to God as they needed to be. Things did not go well for them until they turned to God again. He was there. His mercy is so great. But here they are, ready to cross over the Jordan. But success is promised to them. We already read there from, from chapter 1 where, where the, the, they're being reminded, here's what you have to do. Be successful and prosper. Well, they do so by knowing the will of God and by doing that. In chapter 3, are you back to Joshua now? In Joshua chapter 3, we begin at verse 1. Early in the morning, Joshua and all the Israelites set out from Shittim and went to the Jordan, where they camped before crossing over. After three days, the officers went throughout the camp, giving orders to the people. When you see the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord your God and the priests who are Levites carrying it, you are to move out from your positions and follow it. Then you will know which way to go, since you have never been this way before. But keep a distance of about a thousand yards between you and the Ark. Do not go near it. Joshua told the people, Consecrate yourselves, for tomorrow the Lord will do amazing things among you. Indeed, some amazing things were about to happen. But the point of emphasis right now is on this instruction. How they were told to watch the Ark of the Covenant. There were the proper ones carrying it, the ones who had been assigned that duty by God. And that they were to watch carefully and to go wherever the priests led, where God led the priest with the Ark of the Covenant. They were to follow because, as he said, you've not been this way before. Not to worry. God will show us the way. And the very idea here, think about what this meant, to keep the Ark in view. The Ark represented God in so many ways. It represented his very presence. It was like God was saying to them, keep me in view. Because what that ark contained, the cherubim on top, where in the tabernacle, the presence of God was there. But within the ark, there was Aaron's rod that budded, represented God's miraculous power. And there was inside the tablets of stone where the Ten Commandments were written and carried there representing God's word. There was a pot of manna that represented God's providence, his care for his people for all of those years in, in the wilderness. 
And all of these signs showed God's presence to the people. His strength and his power was among them. And they are being reminded again, don't take your eyes off of God. Watch the Ark of the Covenant because that represented his presence in such a real way. And all of these signs, God showed God's presence to the people. And absolutely, they had to keep their eye on God because he was the one who knew the way. As we are entering into a new year, we have not passed this way before. And so sometimes it's with some fear and trepidation. What are we going to do? What is this year going to bring? Is it going to be good? Is it going to be bad? Are we going to face joy? Is there going to be sorrow? Well, probably some of all the above. How will this year work? How will it shake out? I don't know. I can't answer that for you or for me. But I know this, that we need to resolve to keep our eye on God, understand his word, And do what he has given us to do. And if we do that, in the end, whatever happens, I know we'll be good and we'll be right. We don't know what the future holds. But if we walk with the will, by the will of God, he'll never leave us. He will not forsake us. He is our strength. He is our hope. It's still there in Joshua, back in chapter 1, in verse 5. No one will be able to stand up against you all the days of your life. As I was with Moses, so I will be with you. I will never leave you nor forsake you. Several times we find God saying that in Scripture. And it plays well today. I mean, we we understand the purpose of that Even in the New Testament, the Hebrew writer made reference to that very point, to this passage again in Hebrews 13, verse 5, when he writes to us, even as Christians, let your conduct be without covetousness and be content with such things as you have. For he himself has said, I will never leave you or forsake you. So that we may boldly say, the Lord is my helper. I will not fear. What shall man do to me? From time to time, from time to time, we just have to stop and think about God's purpose and our need and purpose to walk with him. Life is so uncertain. There are so many things that we face day to day that maybe we could not have perceived. We didn't know what was going to happen, but it's going to be okay. If we are walking with God, we know and understand that he is with us and he will never leave us. The time to walk with him is now because there's no promise of tomorrow. You know, Luke read to us a few minutes ago from James chapter 4. James speaks about the uncertainty of life, even as a vapor. We don't know what tomorrow holds. In fact, we don't even have tomorrow, do we? We don't know that. It's always a little bit odd to me and somewhat uncomfortable to think about making plans, you know, far in the future. I was looking at some bananas, maybe it's a silly, I don't know. I was looking at some bananas at Aldi's the other day. And all they had is these green ones. I mean, they were like really green. And I stood there for a moment and I said, you know, I think I'm reaching that point in life where buying green bananas is a little bit optimistic. <laughs> I mean, we, we, we don't know if we have, I don't, have, I don't know if I have five days for those bananas to get yellow or not. Get right. I was talking with my Africa travel partners just recently about making some plans, you know, for a a trip this coming July. And as we we sat down together for a while, about a month ago, really, and as we left, we got some things marked out on the calendar. We got some tentative plans in place. We stood there for a moment, and all of us kind of said together, if God wills. Here we are making plans six, seven months in the, you know, in advance I don't know if I have tomorrow. Such is life. But I I do all right with that, and I trust you do too, knowing that if we are with God, if we are walking with him, if tomorrow in this life doesn't come, that's okay. You know, that'll be okay. But our focus and our goal has to be in this life that we will walk with him. 
And as long as we walk with him and we know and we understand his will, his word, I will never leave you or forsake you. It's what he has told his people from one generation to the next. And we can find comfort in peace knowing that and living by that today. Facing the future can be, it can be inspiring, it can be awesome, it can be exciting. On the other hand, in reality, it can also be challenging, it can be fearful, it can be dreadful, depending greatly what we choose to do with the future. Tomorrow is a blank page to be filled in by the passing of events and, and time. What are we going to do with tomorrow? And the day following and the day following that, should God spare us? What are we going to do with that time? What, what is our plan? Well, at first, remember to number our days. Look at the psalm with me, Psalm 90. Psalm 90. Several points just stand out to me from this text. You know, how, how will we make use of our days? Have we numbered them? That is to recognize there's only so much time. Uh, have we set a course in life to make the most of the time that is given us? Or as the apostle said, redeem the time in Ephesians chapter 5. Here in the 90th Psalm, I'll read about 12 verses or so. I want you to follow with me now. Psalm 90. Lord, you have been our dwelling place throughout all generations. Before the mountains were born, or you brought forth the earth and the world from everlasting to everlasting, you are God. You turn men back to dust, saying, Return to dust, O son of men, for a thousand years in your sight are like a day that has just gone by, or like a watch in the night. You sweep men away in the sleep of death. They are like the new grass of the morning, Though in the morning it springs up new by evening, it is dry and withered. We are consumed by your anger and terrified by your indignation. You have set our infirmities before you, our secret sins in the light of your presence. All the days pass away under your wrath. We finish our years with a moan. The length of our days is 70 years or 80 if we have the strength, yet, us, yet their span is but trouble and sorrow, for they quickly pass away, and we fly away. Who knows the power of your anger? For your wrath is as great as the fear that is due you. Teach us to number our days aright, that we may gain a heart of wisdom. Our focus our focus must be on things for the Lord. Knowing that this life will pass, it's only for a time. We, we make the best of it. Redeeming the time again, as Paul said. Make the best of the time. Have a plan. And we need to have a plan regarding spiritual things, our life in the Lord. Have a plan for that. Some things don't just happen, you know. Some, some things, in fact, most anything of any substance in life comes about when we have made a plan, we've worked for something, and we process it through. Our life as a whole is that way, that we have, need to have a plan. It's a plan to walk with God. I have on occasion been at the airport at the gate waiting for a plane to come, and there are the pilots and co-pilot there waiting too. Sometimes I've enjoyed just walking up and seeing what's going on, talking to them a little bit about the flight. Something that has always been consistent when I've asked some things about the flight is usually I found most of the time they're fairly talkative and they'll tell you all about the flight. Well, we're going to have a smooth flight, you know, for the first hundred miles or so, but then we're going to have to kind of work around some turbulence. We'll probably go to a higher altitude. And, uh, but we should be able to get you in on time to your gates. Wonderful news. It's what I want to hear. They have a plan. I, I, I like having a plan when we're doing something like that. You do too. One occasion flying somewhere, I forget where it was many years ago, it was at night. I do remember that. 
Because out my window on the left side, I could see a storm. I could see the clouds all below us and, 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 and the lightning that was coming up through the thunderheads and a little, a little arc on the bottom. That's the part we see down here. And it was amazing. It was, it was so cool to watch this until we started running into some turbulence. About that time, the pilot came on and said, as some of you on the left side of the plane have noticed, there's a storm going on out there, and we're about to run into it. So if you don't mind, we're going to take a turn to the right. And about that time, the plane kind of did like that. And he said, we're going to go around that. And I said, I'm good with that plan. I, I like that plan. But you see, that was the idea of it. There was a plan. Our life needs to be that way. that we have to understand and determine who we are in this life. And that there has to be a very real understanding that we are servants of the creator, the maker of all things. And that he has provided for us a way and a means that we can walk with him, that we can see him. And when he goes to the left or the right, we do too. Because we're watching him, we are listening to him, and we know his will. That's a plan. That's the plan that God has given us. And that's our goal. Sometimes we have to have some goals to just kind of keep us on track, to, to keep, keep focus in our lives so that we can press on to that higher goal. Our long-range goals, of course, includes heaven. Two passages I want you to go, to go with me here. To Philippians chapter 3. Philippians chapter 3. The Apostle Paul is one who speaks in such terms at different times about running a race. Um, about having a, a, a goal, a focus on what life should be. And certainly in Philippians chapter 3, we see that in a very real way. This is what he's talking about. Philippians 3, we begin at verse 12. Not that I have already attained or am perfected, but I press on. That I may lay hold of that for which I also was laid hold of by Christ Jesus. Brethren, I do not count myself to have apprehended, but one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forward to those things which are ahead, I press toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Absolutely. That's what we have to do. That needs to be our focus. The, the road that we've already taken is gone. It, it's behind us. That time has already been spent. But we can look ahead. We can make a plan for the future. And we're talking about spiritual things here. If you're kind of working out in your mind, you're in your mind day planner here of what you need to do tomorrow or in the next day and the next day for, for work and for at home and for the kids and for school. Well, now look, you're, you're on the wrong page. Come on back. We are talking now about spiritual matters, about getting our life where it needs to be and setting some goals and a purpose that draw us closer to God. That's where our mind has to be. That's where our focus needs to be. In Hebrews chapter 12, would you look with me? Hebrews chapter 12. There's some similar ideas that are shared with us here. Hebrews chapter 12. We think about what Jesus demonstrated for us. Therefore, verse 1, seeing we also are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses. Oh, now wait a minute. What is he talking about? Well, what, what, what is this cloud of witnesses that we are surrounded by? The context, chapter 11, the writer has just reminded us of all of these men and women of faith in the Old Testament who, who by faith obeyed God. At times, in, in Facing some odds that might have seemed insurmountable, but their faith was so great that it demanded a response, and they did just as God said. That is the cloud of witnesses, seeing we also are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses. Let us lay aside every weight 
and the sin which so easily ensnares us and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking to Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. To wear the heavenly crown, to surround that throne of God one time, one day, that is our goal. That, that's our focus. That's, that's the road ahead. That's the road that we need to travel. But how are we going to get there? And what is our plan? Do we want to grow closer to God? I'm sure everyone would say, sure, yes. But how are we going to do that? Do we want to have greater Bible knowledge? You talk about these things with almost anybody, you know, and they say, yeah, I, I, I need to increase my Bible knowledge. Questions come sometimes. I, 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 how can I understand the Bible better? Um, read it. That'd be a good starting place. Spend time in God's word. How, how do we intend to get there? How do we intend to, to get that greater understanding? You know, it's interesting. Some have spent a lot of money in their homes, you know, building an entertainment room. Nothing wrong with that. That can be pretty enjoyable. You know, we could spend a lot of time there, spend a lot of money doing it. I wonder if we are just as willing to spend some time and money to build a quiet place, a study room, where we can just think and focus on spiritual things. I wonder if we would do that. Isn't it kind of about priorities sometimes? We, we do what we want to do. You know, in this coming year, will we make a focused effort to be at every Bible study that is scheduled? Some, some of you are so great at doing this. You know, that when we have a Bible study, some are here every time. Some are not. I've noticed. And, and, and yet at the same time, you might be wondering, how can I understand the Bible better? Well, I'm suggesting. We need to be in our Bible classes together. We, we need to be involved in that on Sundays and on Wednesdays, special occasions when we have special classes, to be involved in these. God willing, we are starting a class in the auditorium on Wednesday night. The class actually kick off next Sunday on foundations. It's a class that's been asked for by several, and that's kind of what is prompting this. Ben and I will be teaching it here in the auditorium. And maybe if you've not been as involved in the adult Bible classes, good time to start. Just saying, here's that opportunity, chart the future, you know, chart the course right, right there, the direction that you want to go. The daily Bible reading, you know, uh, if, if a little poll in class indicates anything, I'm going to say we lost a lot of people in the course of the Bible reading this last year. Sometimes it's hard to pick back up, but it's the first of the year, starting tomorrow our new Bible reading begins, Matthew chapter 1. What a good starting place. You know, the, the, the outline is right here in the hallway. Pick it up on the way out. Let's increase our Bible knowledge this way. There are some who will say, you know, I really need to work on home relationships. Well, great, wonderful. What are you going to do to improve that? It, it doesn't just happen. You know, the entertainment room might not be the answer you know, to improving home relations, not in a substantial and in deep way. You know, some, you know are, are we willing to take some time to read and to study about what it means to be a good husband or a good wife or a good parent? Um, are, are we willing to work on these qualities? Are we willing to do that? Do we want to improve our relationships with brethren? That's a noble idea. Something that would be wonderful. Um, but what are we going to do to get there? What, what's our plan? In, in what way are we going to spend more time with brethren or, or more quality time and draw closer to those of like precious faith? What are we going to do? How are we going to accomplish that? There has to be a plan. You know, in 
biblical history, we see and we find that there are others who journeyed in uncharted territory. And we see how God worked with them and blessed them and gave them strength and direction and they prospered in the Lord. You know, in closing, I want us to look at Hebrews chapter 11. Hebrews chapter 11, that great chapter of faith we just referenced a moment ago. Think about Noah in verse 7. By faith, Noah, being warned by God of things not yet seen, moved with fear and prepared an ark for the saving of his household, by which he condemned the world and became heir of the righteousness which is according to faith. Noah could not have imagined what laid before him when God said to him to build an ark. I can't imagine any way he could have conceived the work and the challenge that was before him. His response, though, was incredible. He did just as God said. And you have Abraham. Back in Genesis chapter 12, God told Abraham, go to the land I will show you. Abraham didn't even know where that was and didn't know where he was going. But here in verse 8 it says, By faith Abraham obeyed when he was called to go out into the place which he would afterward receive an inheritance. And he went out not knowing where he was going. By faith he sojourned in the land of promise as in a foreign country, dwelling in tents with Isaac and Jacob, their heirs with him of the same promise. For he waited for the city which has foundations, whose builder and maker is God. Abraham simply did what God said. And he went on a road not yet traveled. He went where he did not know where he was going. He just followed what God said and he left a trail marked by the smoke from his altars along the way. Moses. Moses left behind what he knew and he journeyed, he journeyed into uncharted territory. Verse 24 begins, by faith, Moses when he had come of age, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the passing pleasures of sin, esteeming the reproach of Christ greater riches than the treasures in Egypt. For he looked for the reward. By faith he forsook Egypt, not fearing the wrath of the king, for he endured as seeing him who is invisible. That is, Moses never took his eyes off of God. These people of faith encourage us. They lift us up. They encourage our faith. And as we start a new year, not without the understanding of God's plan for man. He has made that clear. But with full assurance that he will help us to attain all that he would want and expect to be important in our life. He will help us to get there. He'll never leave us or forsake us. We've never passed this way before, but we travel with confidence knowing that God will walk with us. The choice first has to be our willingness to walk with him. And he will take us and he will lead us if we are willing. If we are willing to go with him. Here we are, starting of a new year, a time of kind of putting some things in perspective, thinking about where we are now and maybe where we need to be spiritually. Maybe there's some changes that need to be made. Maybe we need to be lifted up or encouraged in some way. God will help us. Brethren who love you will help you. Can we encourage you some way today to become a child of God or to get your life in a better direction. Can we help you with that? Can we encourage you? If you need prayers and encouragement of the church, please come as we stand and sing.